Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Pep Canadell uh, from the CSRO Climate Science Center based in Canberra and also the executive uh, director of the Global Carbon Project. Uh, I want to begin by uh, thanking this incredible opportunity to be part of the Climate Change Lecture Series of uh, the APA. It's a fantastic honor for me to, to be uh, part of it. And I also want to acknowledge many of the the colleagues that I work very closely uh, in the Global Carbon Project uh, with, uh, for, from whom I'm going to be showing quite a few uh, of the materials. I'm, uh, I'm speaking from uh, Canberra, uh, and I just realized that from Canberra to Dublin, there's about 17,226 kilometers. And that as much as I would have loved to actually uh, be in Dublin, you know, had not been for COVID, uh, my return trip would have put actually 6,000 kilos of CO2 into the atmosphere just to show the kind of incredible transformation and damage we're doing to the atmosphere and ultimately to our climate. Look, I want to begin by uh, telling you something that perhaps you don't know, but th there's actually hundreds of greenhouse gases that uh, have been produced by human activities. Most of them are what we call synthetic. Um, greenhouse gases. That is, we have produced chemically uh, these uh, greenhouse gases in our chemical industry. Uh, many uh, of them are now heavily regulated because they happen to be also ozone depleting substances and therefore regulated by the Montreal Protocol. But out of all these, many of them uh, on emissions are completely almost finished or going down concentrations in the atmosphere are still there that three that account for 90% of the warming, which is exactly the focus of, of my talk. These three greenhouse gases, they also happen to be um, the ones that they're, because they're not synthetic are in the natural, mix in the natural world. So we have emissions and removals by the natural world. At the same time, we have emissions and in some cases, removals by human activity. And the Global Carbon Project, which is a consortium of scientists from around the world studying uh, these gases, we have spent an incredible amount of time over the last 15 years uh, to exceptional detail to produce what we call these budgets, greenhouse gas budgets. And the way to think about it is exactly the same as, as a household budget, you know, how much money comes in, how much money goes out. And the important thing is how much money is left. And that's all what we care very much at the end of the process of constructing these budgets, that is how much emissions are ultimately left in the atmosphere and therefore affecting the warming potential of the overall uh, collection of greenhouse gases that are part of the atmosphere and therefore uh, changing the warming uh, potential of our climate. So just to go very quickly, uh, we have the carbon budget, which is the most important one in terms of the biggest component of um, radio forcing uh, due to emissions from human activities. And it's important to realize these are very schematic cartoons uh, to realize that emissions from uh, carbon dioxide um, are really expanding the entire energy system from you know, coal, gas, and oil quite a bit of an industry, including cement and some of the plastic industry. But then a lot of the things we've done to, and the way we manage our land, including all the land clearing and, and everything we've done with consequences for river in transport all the way to the coast. And then what we call the natural things, that is the natural system responds to this perturbation and removes uh, at various quantities some of these um, these um, emissions. The global methane budget is it's perhaps even more complicated in the sense that there are many more sources, you know, not all shown here. These are very high aggregation, but we also have a lot of important fossil fuels um, emissions that come from, uh, you know, from the coal industry and mining to the natural gas industry. But then the biggest one that we see in the center, it is the one coming from the agriculture. And, and some of the ways, but fundamentally the way we produce agriculture. And this will be an important theme of this talk because it, it's, it's, it's quite a big deal and a, a big challenge that we have uh, to, to address and perhaps we're not addressing enough. 
And then we have mixed with these anthropogenic emissions, we call them, we have all these natural emissions from wetlands, from inland waters, some geological seeps, even termites. Uh, there could be some permafrost as well, um, uh, emissions coming from natural emissions. And then there's a lot of activity in the atmosphere with high destruction rates. But at this point, of course, we're still emitting much more than what nature is able to uh, to destroy in a natural cycle, and therefore there is um, an accumulation of methane into the atmosphere. The, the other cycle is the global end uh, into a budget. And again, it's quite complex as well. It, it goes across many components. And again, the most important component being agriculture, uh, which um, both agriculture and what we call indirect emissions, these are all the runoff of um, let's say fertilizers used in agriculture going to the rivers, lakes, uh, all the way to the coastal zone, which are, is, are the single most important component and the fastest growing component of this budget as the human perturbation. And again, all the, the various complex um, natural um, uh, destruction of or oxidation of the uh, N2O um, in the atmosphere, uh, we call it the atmospheric chemical sink, which basically gets rid of that, that into uh, mostly in the stratosphere. So I'd like to almost say that there is nothing we can do that it does not release carbon greenhouse emissions of one sort of another. You know, and I'd like to say that you cannot even go for a walk at the beach or anywhere for this matter, of course, even if you leave your mobile phone at home, which is not indirectly emitting greenhouse emissions, you know, the very energy, you know, using your, your muscles to go for a walk is that the very energy that comes from the food, which almost for sure, you know, had emissions of carbon dioxide, methane into all of them or some of it. So it kind of puts in perspective the, the, the incredible complexity and challenge to, to address something that goes across absolutely everything we do in life in our society. So speaking of, of course, impacts of the things we do, which of course has been increasing these emissions nonstop for the last 200 years, has been the effects that COVID and the actual lockdowns due to COVID led to a massive um, basic decline of, of emissions as we slow down our uh, economy and demand for energy. Early April, when the global lockdown was at its peak, you know, we had emissions declining by 17% daily peak decline when compared to a similar dates uh, in, in, in April in 2019. That is an extraordinary drop, never seen ever before. And one that, you know, we're kind of trying to unreveal the potential consequences or what we can learn from it. This 17%, which was a daily peak drop, you know, we think that it's gonna translate ultimately when we are finished the entire 2020 year with a drop of anywhere between minus four to minus seven percent of global fossil CO2 emissions compared to last year. That is a drop that we have never seen before. It's a drop that, um, you know, some say that perhaps in the, la in the, in the Second World War II we had you know, years that they could have been similar. We don't even have the data to actually prove this thing. In any case, you know, the absolute volume of the drop is certainly something that we've never seen in the history of, you know, fossil fuels uh, over the last 200 years. These are our, the global daily fossil CO2 emissions by the main sectors. And I think it was really fascinating to see how the surface transport, mostly road transport, was the single biggest contributor. And of course, the question has been all, I mean, this is not necessarily a, a huge surprise or a huge learning thing, but it kind of reassures us in a way that surface transport, it is indeed, you know, a massive sector of emissions. And as we 
come up with ways to to move into either electrification of hydrogen of our mobility that we know that the sector and the overall improvements uh, of emissions will be very large because it's a very significant sector so we had all sectors really going down industry power aviation from an activities was the single biggest drop because we really kind of uh, put all the planes down and we had not moved them a lot uh, but Aviation contributes about less than 4% of the global CO2 fossil fuel emissions, so that you know the contribution is also small. And we saw in the residential a component, you know, people are staying home, a slight increase of you know the use of, of energy and therefore associated emissions. I think that for me, the the biggest, the biggest kind of drop that uh, or the biggest incredible thing that happened with the with this decline of emissions was not so much the drop but it was the fact that this drop of 17 percent put us down to the emissions uh in 2006 in an average year where we basically you know the full economy was open and everyone was out and about uh, just to show the incredible growth and fast growth of global fossil fuel emissions we've seen in the last 15 years a lot of people have asked us, you know, what's the what's the impact in climate change, and sure, this thing is helping us to slow down so much. And the thing we're saying is, what we're telling them is that what we've done to the atmosphere is to basically kind of pour carbon dioxide into the atmosphere for 200 years, and carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years. So it's like, you know, this 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 big pile of bricks that we have created over the last 200 years, we come to 2020 and one can ask, you know, does it make any difference if instead of putting 42 billion tons of carbon this year, we're gonna put 38 billion tons of carbon? And of course the answer is that the pile wouldn't change that much because, uh, you know, the 200 year accumulation of bricks uh, have really done the damage that we see now. It's a cumulative damage. It's not instantaneous damage that the CO2 does to the atmosphere and to the warming potential and ultimately to the climate change. So the important also thing is that we see that um, emissions have already declined a little prior to COVID. So we had these emissions uh, slowing down at 0.9%, less than 1%, coming from 3% in the, the 2000s. And now we have this COVID, which is gonna even make it go slower. Now put this thing together with this fact that has just happened over the last few months. And that is the top, some of the top, or actually four of the top, well, no, three of the top emitters uh, have actually committed to net zero emissions, which is where we need to go to be able to stabilize the climate. China has made a commitment of net zero emissions. Um, US, it's not. And of course, there's a big question mark of what's going to happen. But there's the real possibility that, you know, we'll have potential a lot of action uh, from the US as well. EU27 plus UK has also uh, done the, the commitment for net zero emissions, and Japan has done it. Altogether, 55% of the global emissions. And it's not just that more than half of the emissions are actually now under some potentially some uh, some under potential commitment of zero net emissions at some point in the mid century, but also the fact that these are, you know, some of the the biggest regional and global leaders who can actually bring together many other groups. And just to show that we can actually do things and that we have done things very quickly. This is the US coal consumption over the last 100 plus years. And in less than 10 years, no one, absolutely no one, not even the you know, um, US Energy Information Administration was able to predict such a drop, such a fallout of the US consumption uh, from coal, you know, bringing you know, clearly a lot of benefits. And the same way, the the global cumulative photovoltaic capacity uh, with the international energy projections versus uh, actual has also been one of the astonishing things we've seen happening over the last you know 
20 years. The way to read this figure is that in 2002, the International Energy Agency you know, projected that this curve was going to be the way we're going to be accumulating new photovoltaic capacity. And what has happened has been that every year that they have updated it, have put it and they have missed the mark of actually what has really happened all the way to 2017. More recently, they have changed the way they do things. So shifting just a little, you know, onto the, the, the kind of mitigation potentials that we want to see, there's a pile of what we call hard to tackle emissions uh, from some sectors, which will, I want to argue that it's very important, and particularly on the non-CO2 emissions, that we develop ways to address these emissions as well. The, important, the importance of it is that the net zero emissions target requires fundamentally to stop all emissions at some point. We know that there's going to be a lot of emissions we're going to be hard to, to, to stop. We just don't know how big this is going to be. And it will depend also how fast we ultimately we try to, to go to Z near net zero emissions. And anything that doesn't kind of, kind of, we don't get rid of it, we'll need to kind of remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in different ways. And that's a terrain that it's a hard one to actually imagine. And there's a lot of expectations we'll be able to do a, a lot of these negative emissions, yet we, we don't know enough about it. So an important component is to really try to reduce with more innovation, the same kind of innovation we've seen in many other parts of the mitigation arena, particularly in the energy arena, try to bring some of these innovation in other areas. And I would argue that agriculture should be one of those as well and some of the land-based uh, mitigations. So I want to give an example of some of this innovation that we see beginning to happen, but perhaps not enough. Um, cows are a very important component. We have a billion uh, cows in the world. We have a billion uh, uh, sheep, uh, and we have half a billion uh, goats. They all emit methane and just to make it understand it, 15% of the cow's energy expenditure goes into methane production. So it's a lot of, uh, of its own energy, which basically gets wasted and with a ramification that's damaged to the environment. Now, we've seen ways that um, specific, you know, algae brings these components, active components, which they are able to uh, reduce to a large extent the methane production and there are opportunities now to, to try to, to bring this kind of bromoform, which is the, the, the active substance of uh, you know, trying to stop or diminish to a large extent um, the methane emissions through the development of feed supplements or the, even the, the, the potential synthesis of this bromoform in the labs, which could lead to, you know, bring a very important more than 80% of mitigation reduction in the livestock, you know, through what could be ultimately uh, um, a, a very straightforward to do it, yet a very com complicated way to still go about commercially. And as I said, from a synthetic point of view, how we were uh, and to do it. In the, in the global end to a budget, there is also so much that we can do. And, and back to agriculture, you know, we find that the application of nitrogen to grow both pasture and crops, it is the single most important uh, component of the perturbation of the, 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 end to, the global end to a budget. And the fastest growing component the one that comes both from fertilizers, chemical fertilizers, and also from, from um, manure that is also being used to increase uh, nitrogen fertilization. And again, I want to I want to emphasize that we need here the same amount of enthusiasm and investment for research and development. A lot that is going on, but perhaps not in the same level that we see being applied in some of the energy world to do mitigation and a transformation to renewable energy. And there are great opportunities for 
increasing the nitrogen use efficiency. 70% of the nitrogen fertilizer that is put into the soil is lost even before it reaches the, the, the plant roots. And so this kind of moves into, into nitrates, it pollutes the water, it moves into nitrification, it produces nitrous oxide, it goes into the atmosphere, a very powerful, um, a very powerful 295, 295 times more powerful than carbon dioxide as, as a warming potential and it stays in the atmosphere for more than 100 years. So ideas and research that is going on, but perhaps much more needs to be done in looking at suppression of soil nitrification. There are plants that they actually produce compounds that they suppress, you know, the, the, the bacteria leading into these various stages of, of, the, of the nitrogen escaping the system that could be developed and ultimately, you know, applied so that the way we use nitrogen, you know, increase its efficiency. We can also look at, and there's been looked this thing, but again, more, much more uh, emphasis needs to be done into the synthetic methods for, you know, uh, replicating what's the biological nitrogen fixation. There's a lot of plants that they take the nitrogen from the atmosphere and they fix it into the plants and utilize it. And those plants, when they're crops, uh, they need much less fertilizer. So again, very complex, sophisticated, um, you know, um, ways to, to, to drive into, you know, the genetics of the plants and how we can actually bring, you know, those, those natural solutions, you know, back into what it is, a huge problem of over-exploitation and overuse of nitrogen use. And for the carbon, I'll just want to, emphasize that there is an incredible interest, of course, on, on you know, other what we call uh, land-based uh, solutions. And these solutions are going to be very important in that component of negative emissions. But it's important that we root it the, the what needs to be done with the fundamental premise that we want to create very resilient carbon stocks back into the, bio, into the biosphere. And one thing that we realize is that out of, out of all the carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere, that's very well established, uh, about 30% of all of it gets removed by vegetation, what we call the land CO2 sink. But out of this land CO2 sink, as much at least half of it comes from regrowing regrowing landscapes, landscapes that had been damaged, degraded, or abandoned after you know, uh, crop production agriculture, as it has happened, of course, in the US, in Europe, in many parts of the world. And they play a really important role. So the first thing that you know, I want to emphasize is that the protection of these secondary forests, it is actually very, very important. This is the, the, the regrowing of the nature that belongs to that place with the composition of species fed by the same system, uh, even if it's partially degraded and it's recovering. And in many countries, these secondary regrowth have had a completely different treatment of protection than the primary forests. And from a, a stability of creating new carbon stock, this secondary regrowth is very important. The second thing is that, of course, we all love tree planting. And the bond challenge actually pursuing 350 million hectares by 2030, it is actually a really, a really well positioned, um, a really well positioned mitigation strategy. And it's important to, to see that that what we want to do is not to plant trees in 350 million hectares. We want to restore you know, places where they had been degraded, you know, of deforested landscapes. So this is really bringing nature back, not just the, you know, planting trees. And a study was done with the commitments of many 55 countries about what they have pledged for these 350 million hectares by 2030 to find that, that almost half of, of, the, of the pledges were to plant single tree species monocultures. 21% for agriculture that mixes trees and crops, and only 34% was truly for restoration of natural forests. 
And the reason this thing matters a lot is because a forest that we can recreate back to what it was before, you know, over the next, the rest of this century could, could take as much as 42 billion tons of carbon in these 350 million hectares. But if we just kind of use the current plants where half of it comes and it goes into single tree species monocultures, this is half by almost two thirds. And if we were just to put plantations, you know, because the rotation and the fact that, you know, we need to constantly cut and replace, we would just do a very small fraction of it, not really, you know, uh, doing the job. And it's important to understand that this restoration, it's not only that provides much more carbon, but provides a much more robust, resilient, less vulnerable carbon to climate change itself and to climate disturbances as they occur either as natural events or events that they may become more frequent as warming proceeds. So restoration to natural forest holds 40 times more carbon than plantations, six times more than agroforestry. And finally, we, we need to do this as the intent of the Bonn big plan of reforestation to do it as really trying to recreate and bring the biodiversity back to it. Again, biodiversity give us a stability of those carbon stocks in the long run, that diversity, uh, it kind of locks carbon in better ways than if we just do uh, long-term you know, planting of uh, plantation, uh, you know, tree plantations. And so we see that all of a sudden, you know, Ecosystems like wetlands, you know, they contribute tremendously to this biodiversity, forests as well, grasslands and arid ecosystems, you know, they can also be big contributors. And of course, wetlands and tropical and subtropical forests have both the highest biodiversity and the most to climate mitigation. But it's important that this map on the left, you know, is a global assessment of places that they could bring all this high carbon biodiversity could benefits to show that there are literally ecosystems all around the world where they, you know, they can bring the best of high carbon density and high biodiversity protection together to develop these more stable and resilient uh, carbon stocks. And just to finish our final, my final remarks, very generic final remarks, I do want to just want to emphasize that the fact that we have to decarbonize the global economy. It is indeed a gigantic challenge. I mean, 80% of our energy still comes from fossil fuels. So this is in humongous what we need to do. There is no, no doubt about it. But I think that there, there is a bit of a perfect storm brewing here of regional commitments and regional and global leadership with a number of countries where it creates, I think that an opportunity as we have never seen before in climate change negotiations of the last 25 years. So I think that it is up to us, you know, what we wanna do with that, but there is a real opportunity which we had not seen in the past. And finally, we do need all mitigation options. I wanna emphasize that all the innovation and research and development we've seen in some areas, particularly in the area of energy, you know, really needs to be at the same level, move into many other components of the mitigation. And I want to emphasize that the land base does require a lot of this innovation. Uh, it does require, particularly in the food system, which is a really important one, the problems are really hard to tackle, but clearly there are opportunities if we you know, emphasize that that more bigger innovation that needs to go. And finally, I do want to say that a speed of deployment, it is now very important. You know, it is very now late in, in the process. We are really into already very significant climate change and warming globally. And I think that the, the speed at which we, we're doing things has become, you know, critical. Thank you very much for this opportunity to, to give this talk.